Greetings everyone. In this lab exercise, we're going to recreate the famous ramp or inclined plane experiments done by Galileo in which he determined the acceleration due to gravity and basically demolished the earlier ideas of the Greeks and Aristotle concerning the laws of motion and what we call free fall. And so in this famous painting, I ass I'm assuming that's Galileo himself standing there sort of giving instructions, confounding all the experts and wise men of, of the Renaissance as to why this ball rolls down the ramp at a constant acceleration. I assume this guy in the front is the heartbeat monitor, which they're using as their stopwatch, basically. So in our recreation of the lab, we're going to use a modern cart and track We'll use video equipment to record the cart going down the track at different elevations. Then we'll take the results from all three runs and plot them on graph paper like this with displacement on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. And then we'll calculate the acceleration due to gravity using similar triangles and see how close we come to the true value of 9.8 meters per second squared. So what are we really doing with this lab? Where are we going with it? These are the so-called five equations of linear motion that we've been covering. The first two are the most important. The last three are just derived from the first two. They're just the first two equations rearranged in various forms. The first equation describes velocity. Average velocity is distance over time. So if you take your new mid-engine Corvette and you go out on a track with all the proper safety equipment and you go 150 miles an hour down the track, you are going 150 miles every hour, literally. See, that's your delta X and that's your delta T, one hour. So that's the idea behind velocity. It's just simply change in position divided by time. How much time did it take you to change your position? The second equation describes acceleration. Average acceleration is change in velocity over time. So let's use the same example. Let's say you take that Corvette and you accelerate from zero to 150 miles an hour in 10 seconds. We'll just make the math easy. First thing we need to do is convert that into metric and I just looked it up and it's equivalent to 67 meters per second. If you accelerated to that speed or that velocity in 10 seconds, your acceleration would look like this. 10 seconds. And that would be 6.7 meters per second squared. Notice you have seconds in the denominator up here and you have seconds again in the denominator down there. So we end up with these units, meters per second squared for acceleration. So that's what acceleration is getting at. It's the change in velocity over time. So you could use equation three to calculate your final velocity at any point in time. Assuming your initial velocity is zero, your velocity at any point in time is your acceleration times the elapsed time right there. So using that as your acceleration, your velocity in this car would be 6.7 meters per second squared times the elapsed time. So after one second, you'd be moving 6.7 meters per second. After two seconds had elapsed, you'd be moving twice that, which is, if I'm doing my math right, 13 0.4 meters per second. After three seconds, you'd be moving three times 6.7 and so on, right up to 10 seconds. At 10 seconds in time, you would be doing 10 times 6.7 or 67 meters per second, which is what 150 miles an hour is. So that's how acceleration works. So now turn that example on its side because right now in the class, we're talking about what's called free fall. We're doing free fall problems. So what causes something to fall? Right away, you're going to say gravity. 
Okay, but go back in time to the time, the, the golden age of Greece. So we're talking about Aristotle, who was a famous Greek thinker about uh, 2,300 years ago. Aristotle taught that objects desire to return to the, what he called their natural place. And so a rock, if you held up a rock and dropped it, it desired to return to its natural place, which was earth. If you dropped the same rock in water, it would go down through the water until it landed on the bottom of the lake because, again, it had a desire to return to its natural place, earth, and it wasn't happy until it was resting on earth. So using this reasoning, if you compare, let's say, a one-pound rock to a two-pound rock and you hold each of them in your hand, the two-pound rock presses down with twice as much force because it has twice the desire to return to its natural place, which is on the ground. So therefore, they reasoned that a two-pound object would have twice the speed. It would accelerate with twice the speed until it hit the ground. That's why it seemed to be pressing on your hand twice as hard. So believe it or not, this idea persisted until about the 1500s when Galileo and, and others started doing actual experiments. Galileo is sometimes called the father of science because he made his experiments look really cool and they got a lot of attention. Others had done experiments before him, but Galileo set them up in a way that made them interesting. What Galileo discovered is that all objects actually fall at the same speed over time. In other words, they fall with the same acceleration. They fall with the same acceleration. And Galileo discovered that that acceleration was 9.8 meters per second squared. What does that mean? It means that any object in free fall will accelerate at 9.8 meters per second squared towards the ground, neglecting, of course, uh, air resistance. Obviously, if you crumple up a piece of paper and drop it, it's going to fall faster than the same piece of paper that's not crumpled up. But if you ignore air resistance, the acceleration due to gravity, which we use a lowercase g, we just denote with a lowercase g, is the change in velocity in the y direction over the time. And on planet Earth, that's 9.8 meters per second. So using our previous example, we could calculate the velocity of any falling object at any point in time uh, simply by multiplying the elapsed time by 9.8 meters per second squared. So after one second, if you drop a rock, ignoring air resistance, it's going to be moving 9.8 meters per second. After two seconds, it would be moving twice that, which is 19.6 meters per second vol final velocity. After three seconds, it would be three times that, and so forth. Okay, so why didn't anyone challenge Aristotle's ideas before the time of Galileo? It would be so simple to knock over his ideas. All you would need is a a tall tower and you could drop objects and measure the time it took to hit the ground. Well, I could give that to you as a thought question, but one of the obvious answers is they didn't have stopwatches. You see in this painting a guy kneeling and it looks like he's measuring his heart rate. That's about the best stopwatch they had. Another method Galileo apparently used was to have a bucket with a small hole in the bottom and to count the number of drops that came out of the bucket as an object was moving. Well, these are real lousy ways of measuring short intervals of time if you're trying to drop objects and get any kind of accurate measurement. So what Galileo did is come up with a very ingenious method of using a ramp, which is what we're going to do in this lab. What a ramp is doing, in essence, is slowing down the ball as it goes down so you have a chance to measure it. 
And what Galileo was able to do is just use simple trigonometry or similar triangles, which is all we're going to do, to convert the acceleration of the cart, in our case, down the ramp into a value for its acceleration if it had just been dropped. And in that way, he was able to get an accurate value for the acceleration due to gravity. So this is what we're actually doing in this lab. We set up a ramp shown here in red. We know the length of the ramp. It's two meters long. We will measure the height at one end of the ramp very carefully. Now think about it. What is pulling the cart down the hill? Gravity is pulling it down the hill. But gravity is pulling straight down like this towards the Earth. So the actual component of that gravity that's actually pulling it is shown here by the letter A. That's the component of the Earth's gravitational attraction that is trying to pull the cart, trying to accelerate the cart down the hill. Now we're going to measure that acceleration. We're actually going to do three runs where we vary the height over here and we measure them very carefully. But we're going to be able to measure the acceleration, the actual acceleration of the cart going down the ramp. So what we've actually set up is two similar triangles. The red triangle and the green triangle are similar triangles. They have the same angles. What we're trying to solve for is G right here because we're putting ourselves in Galileo's shoes. We don't know what the acceleration due to gravity is. Now we could use simple trigonometry to figure out this angle of the triangle right there. We could use the sine function because we know the height over here, we've measured it very carefully, and we know the length of the ramp. It's two meters long, so we could just use sine and get this, this angle in here, but it's just a lot easier to use similar triangles. We can set up a ratio like this in order to calculate G. If we set up a ratio of this side of the green triangle to this side of the green triangle, that ratio is equivalent to this side of the red triangle divided by this side of the red triangle because it's hypotenuse over the short side. G is the hypotenuse. A is the short side of the green triangle. The length is the hypotenuse of the red triangle and the height is the short side of the red triangle. And since we measure A very carefully, we know the length of the ramp is two meters and we measure the height very carefully we can get a value for the acceleration due to gravity, g. And this is actually the exact method that Galileo used. So this will be a step-by-step -step in how to do the lab. The first thing we need to do is level the track. If we're going to elevate one end of the track and get a real accurate measurement of that elevation, we need to make sure the track is perfectly level. So in using a bubble level like this, you're looking at that bubble right in the middle and it has to be centered perfectly and then you know you're starting with a level track. We're going to be doing three runs using three different elevations at one end of the track. An easy way to do this is just to find three books that are approximately the same thickness and then use those to elevate one end of the track. Using this particular two meter track, it works best to have three books that are approximately one inch thick each, or about 2.5 centimeters each. So you can do three runs, one at one inch, one at two inches, and one at three inches. Once you have found three suitable books, it's important to get a very accurate measurement of their thickness. Since we will be using the metric system in this lab, we will ultimately want everything measured in meters. So using a metric ruler, carefully measure the thickness of each of your three books in centimeters and then convert that into meters. So this is what it would look like, in other words, with two books, and then you would need a third book. This person is demonstrating the proper release technique Notice the front of the cart is lined up with the first piece of white tape and the person just lightly holds their thumb on the back of the cart. And this illustrates a nice clean start where the person just lifts their thumb straight up. 
This is a slow motion demonstration of what the camera is doing. Notice the camera is staying just out in front of the cart a little bit. It probably doesn't need to be held this close to the cart. This is just being done for demonstration purposes. The camera lens needs to be a couple feet back. This is what it looks like from the perspective of the camera. Notice the cart starts right at 20 centimeters and the person releases the cart and the camera operator stays out far enough in front so that you can tell exactly when the front of the cart is crossing each line. Next step is to take each video segment and load it into a video editor. This happens to be Movie Maker and I have chopped off the beginning of the video right up to the point where the cart is released and the card can be stopped at each white piece of tape which is every 10 centimeters and the time noted like this right on down the ramp and so a time versus distance plot can be made of each run so one member of the team will need to make a raw data table as shown here with the first column being the distance down the track. So starting at zero and then going out 10 centimeters or 0.1 meter and then 20 centimeters and 30 centimeters and 40 centimeters and so on all the way down the track to the end. In the next three columns you're measuring the delta T in seconds for each of the three runs. This one happened to be 2.5 centimeters or one book. That was two books and that was three books and this is the amount of time elapsed for each piece of white tape basically. So coming out to the first piece of white tape which is 10 centimeters or 0.1 meter the one book track it took apparently 0.83 seconds to reach that point. In the case of the medium track the one with two books which is a little steeper it only took 0.6 seconds. In the case of the three book track which is the steepest it only took about 0.4 seconds to get to that point. So it's really important to first come up with a raw data table before doing your actual graphing. Once you have the raw data table done you can go ahead and get a piece of graph paper and graph out the results like this where you have on the y-axis the distance in meters and you have on the x-axis the time in seconds. So you'll end up with three plots. I chose uh, squares for one, triangles for another, and circles for the other. And then take your time and neatly draw a best fit line as best you can through all the data points. So the next thing you're going to do is take each of your plots and determine the final velocity for each run. So let's take the fast, what we're calling the fast track first. This is the one that had three books had about a 7.6 centimeter rise. Again what this curve here is telling you is it's plotting the distance along here that the cart has moved versus on the bottom time in seconds. And since we know that velocity is distance over time like this you can see that the slope of this curve at any point along the curve will give you the velocity of the cart at that point. Why is that? Because what is the slope? The slope is is rise over run. Slope is always defined as rise over run and in this case the rise is the distance along the y-axis and the run is the time along the x-axis. So I could pick a point right here and I could draw real carefully a tangent line along the curve at that point and that the slope of that line would give me the velocity of the cart at that moment in time. And so using that method we can calculate the final velocity up here in blue of the cart for each one of these three cases. We know the initial velocity is zero and we know the elapsed time from the x-axis. So let's do the fast one first. The fast track is the steepest 
curve. So we're trying to calculate the final velocity of the cart just before it hits the end of the track. Take a ruler and do your best to draw a tangent line that encompasses, say, the last two or three data points. Then using the grid on the graph paper, choose a convenient spot in the x and y directions to complete a triangle, a right triangle. So that would be a right angle right there. Now look at this leg of the triangle. That leg of the triangle, from here to here, represents 0.3 meters. I know that because I came over here on the y-axis and I counted out 0.3 meters. That side of the triangle corresponds to 0.3 seconds. I know that because I went down here on the x-axis where time is plotted in seconds, and I counted up how many little squares there were, and so I know that represents 0.3 seconds. So the velocity final right here for the fast case, for the steep track, in other words, is delta x over delta t, and that's 0.3 meters over 0.3 seconds, and that comes out to one meter per second. So I've just solved the final velocity of the cart just before it hits the end of that track. And in a couple of minutes here, we'll be using that information right up here in the numerator to calculate the average acceleration of that cart down that track. Now, do the same for the middle track. Use a straight edge, don't try to do it freehand, and then complete a right triangle. Just use the small grid squares on the graph paper to find a convenient place to draw a triangle. And in this case, the final velocity of that track of the is the delta x, which is 0.275 meters. And the run, or the x-axis component, is 0.3 seconds. And so the final velocity of that card is delta x over delta t. Plug in your values here, and you get a slightly slower final velocity, 0.92 meters per second. This was 1.0 meter per second, and you would expect it to be a little slower because there were only two books under the end of the track instead of three. And then do the same thing with this, what we're calling the slow track here. It only has one book under the end. It only has a 2.5 centimeter rise. Calculate the final velocity in the same way. I just pick a convenient place to draw a triangle. First I take a ruler and lay down the best tangent line I can that incorporates at least the last, say, three data points, and then get your delta x and your delta t, plug them into the velocity formula, and we get a final velocity for that track of 0.6 meter per second, which is the slowest one which we would expect. So let's review. What have we done up to this point? We've set up three tracks. We have carefully measured the elevation at one end of the track. Then we've carefully plotted distance versus time for the cart on each of these three tracks, plotted it on graph paper, and then graphically determined the slope of the curve near the end of the track for each of the three cases, which gives us our final velocity in each of the three cases. Now that we have the final velocity, we can plug it into the acceleration formula to get the acceleration, basically the average acceleration of the cart going down each track. So before going to the next page, I'll just bring that in closer so you can see what's going on. Your numbers will vary you're probably not going to have exactly 2.5 centimeters and 5.1 and 7.6. Your numbers might be a little different. And you'll probably draw your triangles a little different. So you can't just copy these numbers, but this shows you how it all comes together. Okay, now grab one more piece of graph paper, put the title on it, and draw this picture of similar triangles and then come down a little bit and write case one, slow track. In my case, it was 2.54 centimeter rise. 
you may have a diff slightly different number there. Write the formula for acceleration and plug in the values. For the final velocity, use the value that you just calculated on the previous page. If you forgot where I got that already, I got it from right here. Your initial velocity is zero meters per second because the cart started at zero at the top of the track. Now for delta t, we need to choose a final time that corresponds to the velocity we're calculating. We're calculating the velocity right at that point, right in the middle of this hypotenuse of this triangle. So the time you want to use would be in the middle. So bring that down to the x-axis, and in this case, I'm estimating that's 5.3 seconds. In other words, I'm saying it took 5.3 seconds for the cart to reach this final velocity. So I come down here and I put the 5.3 seconds in the denominator. And I'm calculating an acceleration down the track of 0.11 meters per second squared. So what am I saying? I'm saying that cart on the slow track has an average acceleration right here. I'm talking about that, that arrow right here has an average acceleration down the track, the whole distance down the track of 0.11 meters per second squared. So you're saying, well, that's well and good, but that doesn't help us solve for G. This is what we're trying to solve, isn't it? The acceleration due to gravity, and gravity pulls straight down towards the center of the Earth. So that's where we're going to use similar triangles, just like Galileo did. G, which is what we're trying to solve for the acceleration due to Earth's gravity, divided by the actual acceleration of the cart going down the track, has to equal, by virtue of similar triangles, the two meter track, the, the length of the track, divided by the rise of the track, which in this case, this is the slow track, it was only 0.0254 meters. And so you basically cross multiply in order to solve that, and we get a value, a calculated value of g, the acceleration due to gravity, of 8.8 .8 meters per second squared. Okay, next write case two, medium track, and put in your value of the rise. I'm using 5.1. You'll probably use a slightly different number. Write the equation for acceleration. Velocity final, we just calculated up above, right here, 0.92 meter per second. So we plug that in there. For the initial velocity, we use zero because the cart started at zero. For the time elapsed, we come back up to the curve and we pick a point right in the middle. In other words, we're basically with this blue triangle here, we're calculating the final velocity at that exact point in time, right in the middle of the hypotenuse of the triangle. And so you would just draw a dotted line straight down to the X axis and I'm saying that's about 3.7 seconds there. Plug that in the denominator right there and calculate 0.25 meter per second squared acceleration down the track. Now that we know the cart's actual acceleration down the track in that case, we can set up similar triangles, set up the same type of equation where we put g in the numerator over here, that's what we're trying to solve for, divided by its actual acceleration down the track, which we just calculated. That has to equal, by virtue of similar triangles, the length of the track over the rise of the track. And in this case, I got a very close value, 9.8 meters per second squared. Now, write case three, fast track. In my case, it's 7.6 centimeters rise. Do the same exact thing to calculate its acceleration down the track, and then set up the same equation where you, you have g in the numerator, its acceleration down the track in the denominator, and that has to equal 2 over 0.076 in this case. So we're getting a, g, a value of g of 8.9 
meter per second squared. Okay, now lastly, think about your results and write a brief conclusion. The known value of g, the acceleration due to gravity on Earth, is, to be precise, it's 9.81 meters per second squared. I got these three values, so my average was 9.2 meters per second squared. And now you can include a discussion portion on your lab report. Uh, in my case, it's a little bit under the known value. And so in the discussion section, I might say something like, I would expect that because there is friction. So I would expect the calculated acceleration due to gravity to be a little bit less than 9.8 meters.